She is named one of our time's greatest thinkers by some of the greatest thinkers of our time. She's on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people. In the last five years alone, over 100 of her patents were published. She's been ranked in the top 50 female computer scientists of all time. Mary Lou Jepsen nasceu em 5 de abril de 1965, na pequena cidade rural de Windsor, Connecticut. Filha de Donald Allen Jepsen e Jane Ann Barry Jepsen. Ela possui uma ascendência irlandesa por parte de mãe e dinamarquesa por parte de pai. Ela tem dois irmãos, Donald e Anders, e uma irmã, Laura. No início dos anos 80, Jepsen estudou no Windsor High School. Ela era proativa já no ensino médio, participando de múltiplos clubes de estudantes, como de natação, debate, estudos de francês e até de honra nacional. Depois do ensino médio, Jepsen foi aceita pela Brown University. Lá, ela cursou Engenharia Elétrica e Artes, aproveitando para assistir algumas aulas no Rhode Island School of Design, dada a proximidade das universidades. Uh, I came to Brown mostly because uh, the deal I had with my parents they would help me pay for college if I would get a degree in electrical engineering. I really wanted to do liberal arts, but, so I was sort of picked Brown because it had fulfilled the requirement and I could do much more interesting work I thought. Em 1987, ela pegou seu diploma de engenharia, mas não pôde pegar também o de artes, pois completou os requerimentos cursando e pagando apenas quatro períodos, ao invés dos cinco necessários. De qualquer forma, ela acabou encontrando um mestrado que lhe agradava. Eu me graduei em engenharia, mas eu tive um elective em holografia. Eu estava surpreso. Eu falei, uau, eu não realmente gosto de engenharia engenharia, mas eu posso sort of dive in from this angle. Um, but then the Media Lab, the MIT Media Lab, was starting off. They had taken Steve Benton out of Polaroid to do a master's degree in holography. And so I'm like, whoa, that's the cool place to be. I applied, they let me in. I had no idea I wanted to go to grad school, but like if there was grad school in holography, I was in. E ela topou mesmo. De 87 a 89, Jepsen e seus colegas do Spatial Imaging Group foram pioneiros no desenvolvimento de novas técnicas de holografia. The recently formed Spatial Imaging Group's aim is to develop and demonstrate the powerful potential of three-dimensional imaging as an efficient means for communications. Now, ordinarily, the hologram just looks like a piece of glass or plain film, but when it's angled properly to the light, it uh, diffracts it and sends an image straight ahead to your eye. If you move or the hologram moves, then you see a, a sequence of right to left views that gives you the impression of three-dimensionality. Os dois anos de estudo culminaram em sua tese de mestrado em holografia computacional. Não foi só você que percebeu as semelhanças. Na tese, Jepsen cita hologramas famosos na ficção científica, como em Star Wars. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Seu trabalho no Media Lab pode ser considerado a porta de entrada de Jepsen ao mundo de displays, onde ela futuramente seria novamente pioneira. O que eu fiz como estudante no Media Lab é que nós fizemos o sistema de computação de computação de computação holográfica onde nós simulamos a física da física do holografia no computador e fizemos um display onde os pixels eram aproximadamente o tamanho da wavelength da luz. So then I ended up um, <laughs> putting my resume online. This is like in 1990. And some guy wrote back and, made, and said, hey, do you want to be a computer science professor at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia? And I'm like, 
yeah, sure, send me the ticket. And he did, so I got on the plane and went and did that. And I ended up in Cologne because I got thrown out of Australia. My visa wasn't renewed, it was the misunderstanding. Um, so um, this art school um, said, why don't you come be a fellow? I ended up there sort of taking this project I was working on with an artist from Sydney to make a lunar illuminated hologram that filled a beach go. A artista australiana em questão é Paula Dawson. Dawson já usava hologramas em suas obras, mas tinha em mente um projeto que utilizaria a luz da lua cheia para criar um holograma natural de proporções absurdas. Para isso, houve uma parceria entre as universidades de University of California, San Diego, nos Estados Unidos, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, na Austrália, e... Uh... Academy of Media Arts Cologne, na Alemanha. Como havia sido expulso da Austrália e estava na Alemanha, Jepsen realizou um teste da obra lá, criando um holograma de um quarteirão da cidade. Seus amigos da Califórnia, enquanto isso, ajudaram fabricando o holograma final em si. A obra, intitulada You Are Here, tinha cunho ambiental e conscientizador, e foi produzida como parte de Green World, um projeto maior que incluía até um filme. O Australian Museum possui um VHS provavelmente contendo esse filme. Mas, infelizmente, eles não possuem uma cópia digital, então não tive como mostrar clipes aqui. Em 92, Jepson voltou para Brown University para cursar seu doutorado. Para poder bancar o curso, ela continuou atuando como professora, agora ensinando história da ciência. No meio tempo, ela trabalhou em alguns projetos bizarros, como Moon TV. Another project that a lot of people thought was crazy. I was doing this, I was doing my um, PhD in, in optical physics, but I kept looking up at the moon every night. I was lonely and I would look up the moon and like my friends in Australia or Japan or Germany or wherever I'd been living were looking up at the same moon and I thought, huh, could you do it? Could you project on the moon? And I figured out how by using this solar energy facility in the Mojave Desert and redirecting the sunlight incident on like this square mile of heliostatic mirrors that track the sun that's usually just focus on a vat of water and boil the water to make steam to drive electricity and putting a million dollars of optics on that was enough light to get on the moon. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think of they should. Just because you can do it, should you, is a certainly important question because there were ethical implications not just for that religion but also societies that were pre-technological and, and what could happen to them. So decided not to do it. Right, all right. So well, I'm just wondering what the regulatory issues were around that, you know, just trying to turn the moon into a messaging platform. Yeah, so I had a bunch of uh, musicians, rock stars writing music for it, and MTV was sponsoring it, and Coke and Pepsi were vying for who would be the sponsor. But I got, I got really sick during this time. Mm -hmm. I was doing my PhD in device physics and I had to drop out because I, I was living in a wheelchair. I was sleeping 20 hours a day. My body was full of sores that weren't healing and I, I couldn't even remember how to subtract and I didn't think I deserved a PhD in physics. So I filled out the paperwork to drop out and go home and die because nobody could figure out what I had. And then somebody sprung for the cost of an MRI. They found the brain tumor. It took 30 days to have the brain surgery and get better and then reapply to get back into graduate school because I had dropped out. Jepson teve câncer em sua glândula pituitária, ou hipófise. A cirurgia conseguiu remover os tumores, mas lhe deixou com pan hipopituitarismo, ou seja, sua glândula não produz mais hormônios e ela precisa repô-los usando medicamentos. I had a brain tumor removed 13 years ago, and so if I don't take a bunch of pills and shots and, and patches and a bunch of other stuff every 12 hours, I die. So it's it's always there, it's, it's always in the front, and it, it's, you know, medicine that has had the biggest impact on my life. Depois de ter seu câncer removido, Jepson voltou para o doutorado e conseguiu terminá-lo. Porém, ela ainda tinha muitas contas médicas para pagar, e os salários de professor não estavam sendo suficientes para isso. Assim, ela decidiu fundar uma startup com outros acadêmicos da área, chamada The Micro Display Corporation.
So after recovering, you started a couple of companies, right? Yes. So I started Micro Display and we worked on virtual reality systems and projection displays and wristwatch video and early smartphones. And basically we were putting liquid crystals on silicon chips for very high resolution screens. De 95 a 2003, Jepson foi a CTO da Micro Display, que arrecadou 4 milhões de dólares em sua fundação. O diferencial de sua startup era o aproveitamento de redes de fabricação já existentes, o que facilitava a produção e diminuía os custos. Na época, acreditava-se que displays minúsculos seriam o futuro. E com o interesse crescente em realidade virtual atualmente, eles acabaram sendo, mesmo que um pouco tarde. We started micro displays. It was a big micro display effort. It was thought that that was going to beat um, direct view HD TV. We lost <laughs> LCD one, but we were developing incredible innovation in the backlink where we actually, you know, crank out 20,000 units a month or so for, into head mounted displays and wristwatch video and stuff like that in the 90s. Unfortunately, nobody bought the head mounted displays, so that was, you know, we, we, and so we pivoted to HDTV and, and uh, lost. But. Parallel to this, Jepson também trabalhou com a divisão de pesquisa da Philips no final dos anos 90. Eventualmente, ela deixou ambas as empresas para ser a CTO da divisão de displays da Intel, em 2004-2005, até que resolveu sair da indústria e voltar para a vida acadêmica, como professora no MIT. Eu passei o ano na Intel, como CTO da display division. And uh, convinced Intel to shut it down. <laughs> it was the most difficult professional year of my life up till that point. And at the end of it, I thought I have to get out of industry. I can't take it. I went back in later, but I ended up at MIT as a professor, trying to work on this very problem mm -hmm. of telepathy and how to do it. But it took about a week, and I co-founded One Laptop Per Child with Nicholas Negroponte. <laughs> Em 2005, o fundador do MIT Media Lab, Nicholas Negroponte, começou uma startup filantrópica, chamada One Laptop Per Child. Ele tinha como principal objetivo criar um laptop que custasse até 100 dólares. Para isso, ele precisaria de um display de custo baixo e que também consumisse pouca energia. Para resolver ambos esses problemas, Negroponte chamou Mary Lou Jepsen. Usually screen design takes 20 years and the patents expire. The trick is using the manufacturing infrastructure that exists with no material changes, no process changes, but rethink the conceptual design of it. Half of the children in the world don't have electricity at home, don't have electricity at school. The average power consumption of a laptop is 30 to 40 watts. But a 30 watt laptop means you crank for a minute and you get 20 seconds of charge. That, that's not going to work. We want to crank for a minute and get 10 minutes of charge. So more important than this being a $100 or $180 laptop, this is a 2 watt laptop. E o display não foi o único desafio dessa jornada. Houveram muitos, muitos outros. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you about the, uh, the XO one laptop. There's no hard drive, there are no moving parts. Our peak power consumption is 4 to 5 watts. If nothing on the screen is changing, we want to be suspending the entire machine. We want to be able to suspend in about 100 milliseconds and resume in another 100 milliseconds. A dual mode display, a technology we invented in-house. With the backlight off, it's sunlight readable. So here you see two laptops showing the same image on the screen. Uh, can take power from almost anything that produces reasonable DC. You should be able to screw up your machine for any value of screw up that doesn't involve a soldering iron, essentially, and be able to get back to running state. We can't have passwords. These are five and six year old kids. They don't remember passwords. You can't expect them to read. Each application is essentially running in its own VM and only has the permissions it needs to get the job done. We're putting in LEDs that are actually wired in series in the hardware with the microphone and the camera. Even if the kernel is compromised, you will actually be able to see a soft glow telling you that the microphone and camera are on. Essa startup foi o berço de múltiplas inovações computacionais, incluindo para displays, o que rendeu a Jepson várias patentes. We turn off the light and do this experiment one more time with these uh, two various types of screens. Again, this is what a typical glass screen would be like. All these smudges become instantly transparent, colors wash out, whereas on here, it's basically like a uh, e-ink display on an e-reader. It just becomes stronger and easier to read. So really quite an interesting technology being used there. During his time on One Laptop Per Child, 
Jepson realmente mergulhou no mundo de displays e se mudou para Taiwan para estar o mais próximo possível de onde as telas eram fabricadas. Em 2008, vendo o potencial da tela que criou na OLPC, Jepson formou mais uma startup para continuar desenvolvendo e fabricando seus displays, chamada Pixel T. I started spending a lot of time in Taiwan in 1999 with my company that I co-founded called MicroDisplay. I was an executive at Intel um, and spent a lot of time there. Then I uh, co-founded one laptop per child and architected the $100 laptop and got an apartment in Taiwan to be able to mass produce that and then spun out of one laptop per child and now founded and run a company called Pixel Chi, making innovative screens inside of this infrastructure. What can I do using existing manufacturing process Processes and existing materials to make really radical architecture changes to make things that can ship in volume and really affect people's lives quickly. I moved to Asia, I learned Chinese, I did a startup called Pixel Chi after that through the economic crisis. O impacto de Jepson foi realmente radical, tanto em ideias que foram implementadas quanto nas que não foram. This is, this is one watt, this is one watt, so it really could be enough juice to power the whole device. A bit like a calculator, right? Yeah. It uses a small portion of this. You put it in the light and you can use a calculator. Exactly. Why not do that with a tablet? Usando seus conhecimentos sobre displays de baixa energia e sobre a infraestrutura de manufatura, Jepson fez com que as telas produzidas pela sua empresa fossem realmente únicas. Tão únicas, na verdade, que elas são buscadas até hoje, seis anos depois do fim da Pixel T. Now we're going to go outside and you'll find out what makes this machine so special? It's got a transflective screen in it. This is a Pixel QI display, 10.1 inch. And I have laser cut a little bezel there, so it looks factory. It's kind of like e-ink, except we got, you know, 30 frames per second refresh rate, which is uh, quite nice. And you can see it's, it's black and white here. Once I get in the way of the laptop, we'll go into the dark over here. Em 2012, Jepson foi chamada para ser a chefe do departamento de displays na divisão de projetos secretos da Google, chamada Google X. Por ser uma divisão de projetos secretos, não temos como saber muito sobre o que ela desenvolveu lá, exceto através de suas patentes e histórias que ela já contou em entrevistas. In context of what was then Google X, what constituted a moonshot? A moonshot basically was what Larry and Sergey thought was cool. I think that was the best definition <laughs> of a moonshot. Good definition. Something that they thought was cool enough to put some resource on and explore. And so the Wall Street Journal reported that there was this sort of Lego TV system that Google was working on. It reported that I was involved in it. And if you look at my patents, you can see a way to make screen-like walls where there's no line between it or bezel or anything. Basically changing screens to enable wall-like screens. So I figured out how to do that using really low-cost, high-volume manufacturing processes to make that quickly. Well, you were head of the display division at Google X. How did like innovation work there and how was it different than a startup? Unlimited money. <laughs> That's helpful. It's not. Unlimited money means a lack of discipline. Google X, on some level, part of it was Google learning how to get good at hardware. They're good at, at data centers, but the hardware has taken longer, and it's a large organization getting good at that. The decisions are made by people who have made the most successful businesses. You know, actually, what they're really good at is something else. The math and science have to lead on the decision making for what's doable or isn't, because it can take you three years to make a prototype because there's this fundamental thing about hardware. You can't change it after you ship it. And that means the way you structure the design and development is quite different. I found it way easier to have impact working through a, a VC structure. In 2015, Jepson foi trabalhar com realidade virtual no Facebook, na recentemente comprada Oculus. What was it that took you over to Facebook from Google? Something happened that I really didn't like that is somebody else's story. Somebody I was working closely with was treated very badly by the organization. Mark Zuckerberg had wanted to have dinner. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's go. And then Mark handed me this folder at dinner. It basically added a zero to my compensation. So then I just realized I was worth a lot more to Facebook at that time because 
Mark had bought this company called Oculus. They were working on VR and I built VR systems in the 90s in VR 1.0. The cool patents there are sunglasses VR AR with a toggle. Everybody says, is it VR or AR? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and so you need glasses that can do it all. And so huh. if you look at my patents, you'll see like sunglasses, like no excuse, that form factor. Yeah. That does VR or AR. Porém, Jepson não ficou no Facebook por muito mais tempo. Jepson já há muitos anos pensava em realizar um projeto que diminuísse os custos da ressonância magnética. Ela só precisou de um empurrãozinho para, em 2016, sair do Facebook e fundar sua quarta startup. One of the reasons I left Facebook, Peter Gabriel, the, the rock star human rights activist, I ran into him a few years ago, and about six months before I left Facebook, he started calling me every week, trying to convince me to quit, to do this outside of a big company. In any company, as a technologist, as sort of a top technologist, the work you do is super secret, nobody knows what you're doing, you know, the treat, and, and it just felt like somebody had to talk about this in the open as it was happening because the ethical implications of what we're doing are so profound. Jepson usou seus conhecimentos das áreas de ótica e holografia para desenvolver uma forma de visualizar o cérebro através do crânio, usando luz infravermelha. Imagine this gray block is that arm, and we have light hitting the arm. But some of the light gets to this detector faster. The key to a good image is to not scatter it the light through it. That's why we use x-rays to image the body. The x-rays are not scattered by the human body. Well, the key to this is holography. With very, very small pixels, about the size of the wavelength of light, you can record both the intensity of light and its phase. We can invert the effect of any hologram to neutralize the previous hologram. What I'm talking about is making a hologram of the scattering of our body, computing the inversion of it, and then neutralizing the scattering of our bodies to make them effectively transparent to the light. The problem is our bodies move around a little bit, so the scatterers are changing a bit. So we can't record this hologram in film. We need a computer-generated holographic video system. So here's an example. I focus the light all down to one voxel, and look at what light comes on the detector. So voxel by voxel, we can make a map of our brains and see where oxygen is being consumed. That's exactly what fMRI does. So I'm talking about with an LCD and a detector replacing the functionality of a multi-million dollar MRI machine. Thanks. E é aqui que termina a nossa história, por enquanto. Obrigado pela atenção e até a próxima. O ano de graduação de Jepson na Brown, 87, foi o primeiro na tradição de usar gaitas de folha. Jepson é amiga de Knuth, o lendário cientista da computação. Durante o projeto, tentei usar as versões mais contemporâneas possíveis de vídeos e imagens. Isso inclui filmes, dos quais tentei buscar clipes adequados à época. I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think they should. Não fala alemão, então não consegui pronunciar o nome original da Academy of Media Arts Cologne. Para isso, pedi ajuda para alguns amigos. Kunsthochschuss für Medienkorn. Kunsthochschule für Medienkorn. Kunsthochschule für Medienkorn. Esse projeto levou aproximadamente um mês e acabei com 20 gigas e quase mil arquivos.
You know, uh, Mary Lou Jepson, one of the world's foremost innovators in the field of electro, optic, and display technology, is an alumna of the Media Lab, having completed her master's degree working with holography pioneer Steve Benton. She is the executive director of engineering at Facebook and head of display technologies at Oculus, and previously headed the display division. Display division, okay. End up there. It's right here. Come on.